Okay. So, like we have been discussing, uh, there are different types of forces which can provide us with centripetal force, as is be the heading, the different phases of centripetal force. One of those forces which can provide us with centripetal force is the tension which is in the rope. So if you have a mass, then this mass is attached to the end of a rope, then this mass is wheeled in a circular path by a person or something, as we can see uh, in this diagram here. So you've got a mass which is being forced to move in a circular path like that. <coughs> The mass is moving with some constant velocity as is per centripetal force so it has to move so not some constant speed so the mass moves with some constant speed but it is continuously changing direction so that it's moving in a circle like this now the reason why this particular mass is being forced to move in a circle is because there is tension which is in the rope the tension which is in the rope like this is the one which is providing the centripetal force. So in this case, as you can see from figure number three, the tension is going to be equals to the centripetal force. So here it's very straightforward. This is if you force this mass to move vertically like that. But you can also have another case where you, you have a mass whose weight you can neglect. In that case, the weight of the mass is not so much so you end up having something moving in a circle, as we are going to see in the next example. So also in that case, you end up having uh, the tension being the one which is providing the centripetal force. So if you've got a case like shown in figure number three, just the tension, which is a force which is generated in the rope, is the one which provides the centripetal force. Just straightforward like that. Are we clear? If you, there's a mass attached to a rope, then this mass, as you will, this mass, you force this mass to move in a circular path, then in that case, the tension which is generated in the rope is the one which is providing the centripetal force, Ft. So we have got an example to look at, example number four. Uh, a 200 gram object is tied to the end of a cord, which is just a rope, and weld in a horizontal circle of radius 1.2 meters at a constant 3.0 revolutions per second. Assume that the cord is horizontal. So in this case, we're not doing vertical like has been shown in our, in, in our figure here, but you're doing it in a vertical way. So assume the cord, so assume, yeah. assume that the cord is horizontal. And the reason why it's going to be horizontal is that gravity is being neglected. Okay, so in this case, uh, we have a mass, 200 grams, attached to the end of a rope. And this rope has got a radius, this circle in which, the circle in which this mass is moving has got a radius of 1.2 meters. And it is moving at a constant uh, 3 revolutions per second, which is basically the angular velocity in this case. So the first thing which we are being asked is to find what is the acceleration of the object. So if you know the radius of the circular path in which something is moving and you also know the angular velocity with which this particular object is moving, you can always work out the acceleration of the object in question. So the mass of the object is 200 grams and that is in kgs that is 0.2 uh, kgs the radius of the circular path in which the object is moving is 1.2 meters and the angular velocity is 3 revolutions per second. So we can change these revolutions per second into radians per second. So we end up having 3 revolutions per second is equal to 1 revolution divided by a second times 2 pi radians divided by 1 revolution. So the revolution is this one and that one they cancel out. So you end up with your 3 revolutions per second being equals to 18.8 radians per second. So we know a couple of things. We know the radius of this circular path in which the mass is moving, 1.2 meters. We also know our angular velocity in radians per second to be 18.8. So with this information, it's possible for us to work out the acceleration. So the centripetal acceleration, 
AC is going to be equals to the radius of the circular path multiplied by the angular velocity squared. So in this case, you're going to have AC equals to 1.2 meters multiplied by 18.8 radius per second, the whole thing squared, and you're going to end up with your acceleration AC being equals to 424 meters per second squared. So this is going to be your centripetal acceleration. This centripetal acceleration, centripetal acceleration is always due to the fact that this particular object's velocity is changing direction. This particular object is always changing direction. So all this, which are seeing 424 meters per second squared is due to the fact that an object is changing direction. Objects undergo the largest amount of acceleration when they change direction. When an object changes direction, that is when it undergoes the largest amount of uh, acceleration. Are we clear? Is it clear what you've done? Hello? Okay. Now that we have our centripetal acceleration, which is 424 meters per second squared, we can find this next, you are told to find the tension in the cord. Now, this tension in the cord is equals to the centripetal force. So before we find the tension in the cord, we need to find out how much centripetal force is required to give our mass this amount of acceleration. So in that case, the centripetal force, Fc, is going to be equal to the mass attached to the end of the cord multiplied by the acceleration of the mass. So the mass attached to the end of the cord is uh, 0 0.2 kgs multiplied by the acceleration, which is 424 meters per second squared. So when you work out the centripetal force, in this case, the centripetal force is going to be approximately 85 newtons. That will be your centripetal force, approximately 85 newtons. Are we clear? With this centripetal force of 85 newtons, we know that the tension is the one which is providing the centripetal force. Therefore, we equate our centripetal force to the tension, so we end up having a tension which is equals to 85 newtons also. Is it clear? This is when you have something being whirled in a circle horizontally, then you can ignore and you can ignore the weight of the object which is being forced to move in a circle. If the weight of the object being forced to move in a circle can be ignored, then the centripetal force in such a case is just being provided by the tension. However, that might not always be the case. Sometimes what has been attached to the end of the cord might be a heavy mass. If a heavy mass has been attached to the end of the cord, then the weight of that particular mass cannot be ignored. In such a case, the rope which is attached to the mass is going to be inclined at an angle theta, the vertical as shown in figure number four. So you end up with something like this, where this bit here is the rope and the mass being forced to move in a circle is what we have here. This is because this particular mass is heavy. So if the mass is heavy, then the rope cannot be horizontal. Are we clear? If the mass which is attached to the rope is heavy, then in this case, you can't have a rope which is horizontal like this. It will have to be at an angle to the vertical like this, as has been shown here. Now, you have a rope which is at an angle, which means that if the rope is at an angle, this rope, that's where the tension is. However, this mass is going to be moving in this circular track, like this. That's how the mass is going to be moving. It's going to be moving in a circular track like that. So if the mass is going to be moving in such a circular track like that, then it means that it's not the tension 
which is forcing this particular object to move in a circular track like this. But it's only part of the tension because with this bit, you have got a tension pointing in this direction, then the object is being forced to move in a circular path like this, there has to be a force which is pointing in this direction. And the force which is pointing in that direction is the, what we have here, the horizontal component of the tension, which is equals to T sine theta, and the vertical component of the tension is pointing up like this, which is equals to T cos theta, and this component of the tension, T cos theta, is pulling the mass up, as you can see, T cos theta is pulling the mass up, and in this case, the, the weight of the mass is pointing down. So we are using this angle here to find the components. This is the angle we're using. The angle which the rope makes with the vertical. This angle theta. So this theta, if it's angle theta, then you end up with this bit becomes the opposite. That's going to be T sine theta. And this bit here is going to become the adjacent, which is going to become T cos theta. So in our case, this opposite here is T sine theta. The adjacent is T cos theta, but this opposite here, which is T cos theta, in our case here, this is the X component of the tension. So T sine theta and like that. And you have T cos theta. Is that clear? Yes, sir. Okay. So, the centipede yes, of... Is it clear? Yes, yes. So the centripetal force in this case is being provided by T sine theta. It's T sine theta which is providing the centripetal force, the horizontal component of the tension. So we can proceed to write the following. Fc, which is the centripetal force, is provided by T, uh, Ft, the tension, multiplied by uh, sine theta, or the horizontal component of the tension. Like this. The other bit you're supposed to be aware of is since this particular object is going to be moving in a circle like this, okay, there's always a radius to this circle. The radius to the circle is due to the length of the chord, how long this is, multiplied by the sine of this angle here. So the length multiplied by sine theta is going to give us the radius of this circular path. There. It's going to give us the radius of the circular path. So we're going to have R equals to L sine theta, like that. R equals to L sine theta. So that's going to be our radius. So uh, Fc is our centripetal force is equals to uh, the tension tensor of the tension force multiplied by sine theta, which is our what's providing the centripetal force. Now we know that our centripetal force Fc is equals to the mass of the object attached to the end of the chord multiplied by the speed with this object is moving the speed squared divided by the radius like that um, so when we equate these things so you end up having uh, mv squared divided by r is going to be equal to ft sin theta so mv squared divided by r is goes to ft sine theta, like this. Now, with what we have here, we know what the angle is, fine. We know what the radius is, r. We do not know what the mass is. We don't know what the velocity is. We also don't know what the tension is. So we have to, there are a couple of things which you don't know. We don't know what the mass of the object is. We don't know what the velocity is. That's most, mostly what you're looking for. We also don't know what the tension is. So we have to make this expression much easier. And the way we do that is by using what we have here. We use this expression. We use T cos theta and mg. Now, as long as this particular object is moving in a circle like this, it's not going to rise up. It's also not going to go down as long as it's moving in a circle. It's not going to rise up and it's not going to go down. So what that means is that T cos theta is basically equals to mg because there is no acceleration along the y direction here. So you've got T cos theta being equal to mg. And how do you know that they are equal? Well, because there's no acceleration. You can work out the resultant force in this case. 
The resultant force of the forces along the y is going to be caused to the mass multiplied by the acceleration in the y. But acceleration in the y, ay, is equals to 0 meter per second squared. So in this case, uh, the force which is pointing up, which is the t cos theta, we choose that to be positive, it's pulling up the mass. Then the other force, which is the weight of the object, mg is pointing down. So if we choose up to be positive, down to be negative, then we end up having our resultant force in the y direction being written as follows. So we're going to end up having our resultant force in the y direction, uh, the sum of the forces in the y direction being equals to ft cos theta minus the weight. So our resultant force, we, we substitute here, we're going to have ft cos theta minus the weight equals to the mass of the object multiplied by what the acceleration is. We know that the acceleration is zero. So in this case, mass multiplied by zero acceleration is going to give you a zero this side. So you end up having ft cos theta minus the weight equals to zero. And that's going to end up, when you check this, the other side, you end up having ft cos theta equals to fw, which is the weight. Now we know fw is just mg. So we end up having ft cos theta is equals to mg. Now the reason why we are doing this is because we want to find an expression for ft which is a tensile force. So in this case, the tensile force ft is going to be equal to the weight of the mass divided by cos theta. So this is how you're going to get your tensile force. It's going to be because the weight of the mass uh, divided by cos theta, mg divided by cos theta. Now, why is this important? With this ft equals to mg divided by cos theta, we can come back and put this here. We can put it here. Ft. Where this Ft, we can now write mg divided by cos theta. So when you do that, we end up with this. So we have mv squared divided uh, by r is equals to Ft sine theta. Then when you, where there is Ft here, we put what we have found here, mg divided by cos theta. So we end up having mv squared of r is equals to mg cos theta multiplied by sine theta. That's going to be this multiplied by that. So you're going to have mg sine theta on top, then divided by cos theta. Then you factor out the mg. So you're going to end up with mv squared of r is equal to mg multiplied by sine theta divided by cos theta. Now, sine theta divided by cos theta is just the tangent of theta. So in this case, you're going to have mv squared of r is equal to mg tan theta. Okay, is that clear? Okay, next you notice that there is an M this side, there is this M, there is also this M here. So those M's can be cancelled out, when you cancel out this M and that M, you're going to end up with V squared of R is equals to G tan theta. Then when you multiply on both sides by R, this side you multiply by R, the other side you multiply by R, you're going to end up with V squared is equals to G R tan theta. Since you're looking for velocity, you want to find out how fast this thing is going is moving in a circle, then you're going to take the square root on both sides, so you're going to end up with V is equal to the square root of G R tan theta. So you can see that the velocity depends on the length of the circular path in which this particular object is moving. It also depends on This bit, the angle, tan theta, it also depends on theta through the tangent. So basically, this is the expression you're going to use to find how fast this particular, uh, what is, this particular mass is moving in a circle at a particular angle. Okay. Is that clear? Sure, sir. Okay, so that is if the mass is heavy and its weight cannot be ignored. So we've got example number five, which is based on the same thing. So as shown in figure five, a ball B is fastened to one end of a 24 centimeter string and the other end is held fixed at point Q. The ball wells in a horizontal circle shown. Find the speed of the ball in which uh, find the speed of the ball 
in its circular path if the string makes an angle of 30 degrees to the vertical. So the angle which the string makes is 30 degrees to the vertical here and we are being asked to find what the velocity is going to be. Just a minute. So in our case, we know the formula. We have the expression for finding the velocity. V is equals to the square root of G R tan theta. So the only thing we need to find is what R is. And also we have got theta, which is 30 degrees. So in our case, the length of the string is 24 centimeters. This is the length of the string, 24 centimeters. It makes an angle 30 degrees. Therefore, we can find the radius this particular mass is moving in a circular path like that. Therefore, it's possible for us to find the radius of this circular path here. So the radius of this circular path, R. So we have this bit. Velocity is called the square root of G R tan theta. In this case, our R, which is the radius, is going to be uh, equals to the length. Because this is a triangle here. You have got a triangle like this, which makes a right angle triangle. So the angle... Here is 30 degrees, the hypotenuse is 24 centimeters, then you're looking for the opposite in this case. You're looking for this part here, which is the red, which is the radius of the circular path. So the radius of the circular path is going to be equals to just at uh, the length of the string, which is 24 centimeters, uh, 0.24 meters multiplied by sine theta, and you're going to end up with the radius, which is equal to 0 0.12 meters. So this is going to be the radius. Then the acceleration due to gravity on Earth, we know that's 9.8. Then we have with the angle, theta is uh, 30 degrees, so we can make the necessary substitutions in this case. So when we make the substitutions in this case, so your velocity v is going to be because of the square root of, uh, for g, you put 9.8 meters per second squared. For your r, you have worked out your r to be the radius of the circular path to be 0 0.12 meters, which is what you put there. Then the other bit is tan theta. We've been given the angle that the angle is 30 degrees tan theta like that. Then you're going to end up having a velocity v is equal to 0 0.82 meters per second. So that's the speed with which this particular object is going to be moving in a circular path. Are we clear? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. The other bit which we have to look at is uh, something called a banking. Okay, so in this case, basically what you have normally... Uh, Sir. Yes. Sir. Uh, my question. You have a question? Okay, go ahead. How you find the radius? How you find the radius? The radius is this. The radius of the circle, right? The circular path. You have seen this? From here to here. Do you see that? From here to there, that's the radius. But you've got the length of string. The length of string is 24 centimeters. Yes, sir. This is a hypotenuse. If you look at this as a triangle like this, so that's going to be a hypotenuse. Yes, this sir. is going to be opposite. This is going to be adjacent. So you can work out the sign. So in this case, the sign sine sign 30 degrees is going to be equal to the opposite, which is BC. That's going to be opposite or the radius yes. divided by the hypotenuse, which is between four centimeters. So you, since you're looking for the radius, then you can find your radius R being equal to this 0 0.24 meters multiplied by sine theta that's what's going to give you your radius as here 0 0.12 meters so your radius r is going to be equal to the length of the chord 0 0.24 yes, meters multiplied by sine 30 degrees and you're going to get this so that's how you get your radius is that clear Okay. Uh, 
next bit is sometimes centripetal force is provided through what's referred to as a banking now when you have a banking or you've got a banked rod a banked rod is a rod that is raised on one side on a curve so when a rod is going on a curve then engineers raise the rod on one side like this so one side of the rod is raised like this the reason why they do this now this is what is referred to as a banking the reason why they do this is because they want to keep the car moving on the road by providing what we call a centripetal force now this centripetal force is provided in a clever way by using one of the components of the normal force as i'm going to explain so in this case what you have here as you can see this is a rod which has been raised at an angle theta one end of the rod has been raised at an angle theta However, as this car is moving on this rod, the weight of this car is always pointing downwards. As is all the as is weight all the time. The weight of the car always points down. This is the W which is pointing down. However, since the rod is not flat, is not uh, level, it has been raised, there is also what's referred to as the normal force. The normal force which because this car is exerting a weight on the rod, the rod is not going to be happy about this. So the rod is going to push back against the car. So the weight of the car is pushing the rod against the rod downwards. But because of the way roads are made, roads tend to push back. So the rod is going to push back at 90 degrees to the surface of the rod. So that's why you have got this end, the angle end here pointing in this direction it has to be always at 90 degrees so what you have here is the weight always pointing downwards then you also have with a reaction of the rod pushing against the car at this particular direction this arrow here the red arrow pointing up the red arrow pointing down is the weight the red arrow pointing up in this direction that is a normal force Okay. Is that clear? The first thing, the weight is pointing down, the normal force is pointing in this direction. The reason why the normal force yes, has to clear. why the normal force has to point in this direction is because the normal force always acts at 90 degrees to a surface. If it pointed anywhere else, then it wouldn't be 90 degrees. So it has to point in that particular direction. So, sir, in short, you mean that the normal force always pulls the car at an angle of 90 degrees? Always. The normal force does not pull. The normal force pushes upwards. The normal force of anything always pushes whatever thing you've put on a surface upwards at an angle of 90 degrees. Okay, sir, thank you. Yeah, so the normal force is pushing the car up at an angle of 90 degrees to the surface. Always, that's what a normal force does. Now, with this normal force, okay, with this normal force, you will notice that this car is not going to move up and down. It's not going to be jumping up or down. Like, uh, it's not going to be doing that. It's just going to stay on the road. The reason why the car is going to stay on the road is because the weight of the car, which is W, which is supposed to sink the car in the ground, is being balanced by this black force here. You have seen the black force pointing up? Yes. This black force pointing up here. This black force pointing up here is a component of the normal force. So this normal force which is pointing in this direction, you can break this normal force into this black arrow, that's a vertical component of the normal force. You can also break this uh, from this and also this other small black arrow which is pointing in the vertical, sorry, in the horizontal direction, this bit. So the weight of the car, W, is balanced by this guy, which is a horizontal, comp which is the vertical component of the normal force. 
Uh, there is also this other force which does not seem to have anything else connected to it. This is the force which is keeping the car moving in a circle. This is the force which is providing our centripetal force. Are we clear? This little force, the one which is horizontal, this is the force which makes the car to continue moving in a circle. So this hori uh, horizontal component of the normal force is the one responsible for the centripetal force. If you see something moving in a circle, there has to be a force which is making that particular something to move in a circle. So, the normal force, which is at 90 degrees to the surface, has got two components. There is one component of the normal force, which is this black line, which is pointing up. There is another component of the normal force, which is this horizontal line, which is pointing horizontally like this. The car does not move up and down because this bit balances the weight. But there is also this other guy which is causing the car to move in a circle. Okay. So the centripetal force is provided by this little black line. Now here is where things get a little bit interesting. This angle of the banking, the angle of the banking here, theta, this angle of the banking theta also turns out that this angle theta is equal to the angle between the normal force and the vertical component of the normal force. This black line, the angle between this black line and this normal force. There is this angle being shown here. This theta. Can you see that? Yes. Yes. So the angle of the banking theta is equal to this angle here. If that's the case, then it's possible for us to find out exactly how much is this vertical component of the normal force and also how much is the horizontal component of the normal force. So in our case, uh, the vertical component of the normal force is going to be equals to the normal force, then cos theta. What, that's what you have here. Here. N cos theta. The normal force multiplied by cos theta. This is going to be this black line pointing up. The other one which is pointing in the side here, this one here, this is going to be the normal force sin theta. And this is the one which is providing the centripetal force. That's why you can see here, Fc is equal, uh, n sin theta is equal to Fc. So the horizontal component of the normal force, which is the normal force sin theta, in this case is the one which is providing us with the centripetal force. Is that clear? Yes, I clear. So, with this information, then we can proceed to do what we have been doing. We know that the centripetal force, Fc, is equal to the mass of the object which is moving in a circle multiplied by the speed squared of the object moving in a circle divided by the radius of the circular path in which this particular object is moving. Now, in our case, this centripetal force, Fc, is being provided by this guy normal force multiplied by sin theta that's what's providing our centripetal force this is what's providing the centripetal force therefore we are going to end up with the following expression we are going to end up with fc equals to fn which is the normal force multiplied by sin theta so that's what that's a component of the normal force which is providing the centripetal force so we end up with 47 uh m uh multiplied by v squared divided by r is equal to fn sin theta. So this is the expression which is giving us the centripetal force in this case. However, like previously, yeah, because the rod has already been made, you can just measure what the angle is. You might also know what the radius is, but there is a number of stuff you don't know. You do not know what the mass of the car is, which is going to be passing on the rod. You do not know what the velocity of the car is supposed to be you also probably don't know what the normal force is supposed to be. So there's a couple of stuff which you do not know. We don't know the mass, we don't know the velocity or the speed of the car, we also don't know the normal force. However, we can do something about the normal force, even if we don't know it very much, but we can always do something. We know that the weight of the car, whatever it is, mg 
is equal to the comp this component of the normal force. The reason why we know this is because the car does not fly up or sink down. There is no acceleration in this particular direction. The car just stays on the road. So if the car just stays on the road, it means that it's not flying up, it's not gaining height, or it's not losing any height. It just stays on the road. Therefore, there is no acceleration in that particular direction. So if there is no acceleration in that particular direction, we know that if there is no acceleration, then the acceleration is meters per second squared. Then we can write Newton's second law of motion. The sum of the forces in the y direction is going to be equal to the mass of the car multiplied by the acceleration in the y direction. If we choose up to be positive and down to be negative, so if we choose up to be positive, that means that this is going to be positive. So your normal force cos theta will be positive and the weight of the car is going to be negative. So you can find your resultant force. In this case, you can find what the resultant force is. Then we multiply equals to the mass of the car times acceleration, but our acceleration in this case is zero. So we'll end up having a resultant force, uh, Fy, uh, the sum of the forces in the y direction equals to the normal force multiplied by cos theta. So the normal force of the car uh, multiplied by the normal force exerted by the rod on the car multiplied by the cosine of theta uh, minus the weight of the car. So when you write this, uh, we rewrite our Newton's second law of motion. It's going to be the normal force cos theta minus the weight of the car equals to the mass of the car times acceleration. But since the car is not moving up and down, it's just moving straight on the road. There is no acceleration in the y direction. So our acceleration is going to be zero. So when you multiply the mass times zero acceleration, you're going to get a zero this side. So if you get a zero that side, then we can rewrite this whole thing. So Fn cos theta minus Fw equals to zero. So we can write Fn cos theta equals to Fw, which is the weight. So Fw is the weight, so we can end up with Fn cos theta is equals to mg, which is the weight of the car. So with this expression, we can try to find an expression for the normal force. So we divide by cos, by cos theta on both sides. When you do that, you're going to end up with Fn, which is the normal force, is going to be equal to the weight of the car divided by cos theta. So this is what's going to give us the normal force. The normal force is going to be equals to the weight of the car mg divided by cos theta. So now that we have got an expression of the normal force, we come back up here. Remember what we have? We have got mv squared over r is equals to fn sine theta. So for this fn, we can put the expression we have found for fn, which is mg cos theta. So when you put it there, here. So mv squared uh, divided by r is equal to fn cos theta. So for this fn, we can put in mg cos theta. So when you do that, you end up having mg squared, uh, mv squared of r is equal to uh, the weight of the car, then cos theta multiplied by sin theta. So that's going to be mv squared over r is that's going to be the weight of the car times sin theta, then divided by cos theta. Then you factor out the mg, so you end up having uh, m v squared over r is equals to mg sine theta divided by cos theta. Sine theta divided by cos theta is just the tangent of theta, tan theta in this case. So you end up having mv squared over r is equals to mg tan theta. Are we clear? Okay. Next, you notice that there is an m this side. There's also an m that side. So if you cancel out the m's, so you end up having v squared over r is equal to g tan theta. Then you multiply by r on both sides, you end up having uh, v squared is equal to g r tan theta. Then you take the square root on both sides. So you're going to end up with v is equal to uh, the square root of g r tan theta. So the velocity of a car on a banked rod, v is equal to uh, g r the maximum velocity basically is going to be equal to you can move with this velocity which is lower but this thing here this velocity which you have here it's giving you what is what should be your maximum velocity on this road so in this case the velocity of the maximum velocity is going to be g r tan theta okay are we clear There are certain things which are not going to change. For example, if a road has already been built, theta will not change. Also, the radius of the road will not change. 
So what we have here, g r tan theta, this represents a certain velocity. Basically, this is a maximum velocity with which you can drive on this banked road. Okay, you can drive with a, with, with a smaller velocity, but with this particular property, with these particular quantities in place, if they are already fixed, it's giving you what your maximum velocity should be when you're driving on this road. Are we clear? Yes. Okay, so we have our last example, number number six. Uh, so a curve of radius 30 centimeters, oh, sorry, a curve of radius 30 meters is banked so that a car may take the yes, turn at a speed of 13 meters per second without depending on friction. What must be the slope of the curve or what must be the banking angle? So here we've been told that the radius of the road is 30 centimeters. And this at, at this radius of 30 centimeters, the car can travel at a speed of 13 meters per second without depending on friction before you need to apply the brakes. If you go above 13 meters per second, your car will start getting out of the road, then you need to apply brakes. Okay, so basically the velocity which you have here, V, is the maximum velocity with which you can drive on this particular banked section of road before your car can begin to slip. So they're asking us to find what the banking angle is, theta. They're asking us to find theta. What is theta? So in this case, the radius, R, we've been given, that is 30 meters. We've been given the velocity V, that the velocity is 13 meters per second squared. So the only thing we need to find is theta to find the banking angle. So we're going to use that expression. So R is 30, uh, 30 meters. Um, then the velocity we've been given is 13. So we're going to use that expression. So V is equal to the square root of GR tan theta. So in our case, our V is 13 meters. Then of course our R is known. So since we're looking for theta, we, we, from this expression here, V is equal to square root of GR tan theta. We'll square both sides. With the square both sides, we're going to end up with V squared is equal to GR tan theta. Then we divide both sides by GR. When you do that, you divide this side by GR. Then you also divide this side by GR. So you're going to end up with tan theta is equals to V squared of R, V squared divided by GR. Now we know that V is 13 meters per second. Our G is 9.8 meters per second and our R is 30 meters. So when you substitute those values, we're going to end up with the following is tan theta is equals to 13 meters per second squared divided by 9.8 then 30 so this 13 second square that's going to be 169 meters squared second squared then the whole thing divided by 294 meters squared second squared then you divide you end up with tan theta is equals to 0 0.57 like that then you work out the arctangent of this to get your theta theta is going to be equal to a uh, tan inverse of 0 0.75 and you're going to get your theta as approximately equals to 30 degrees so your banking angle is going to be 30 degrees are we clear yes any questions now sir what if uh, there you said the velocity that is there we can uh, that formula is only used when we are asked to find the the highest velocity what if we are just asked to find it, the lowest velocity is it normally we don't ask you to find the, the lowest velocity is zero so the car is not moving so it's, it's there's nothing interesting about lowest velocity okay sir thank you yeah any other question yes can you speak up i can't hear anything you're saying I'm still not hearing anything. Can you move closer to the microphone? So I'm saying, why don't we consider the friction force when it comes to regarding the banking? Why don't we consider the friction force? The reason why roads are made like this is so that you don't have to apply brakes. Because if you apply brakes, you're going to stop. Are we clear? Sorry? 
there is always a small amount of friction it's very very small which means that it can be neglected that's why we are saying here without depending on friction this amount of friction which is there with the tires is very very small it's small but in this case we still have to continue if you apply more friction your car is going to come to a stop but we need our car to move at a constant velocity any other question You have to remember what it is we are talking about. We are talking about centripetal motion. With centripetal motion, you have something moving in a circle at a constant speed. So this particular object still has to move in a circle at a constant speed. The acceleration comes from the fact that the direction of this particular object is constantly being changed. And the reason why the acceleration is being changed is because there is a force which is being applied on this particular object moving in a circle. That is what the centripetal force is. Are we clear? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, uh, so we're going to stop here. Uh, good luck tomorrow. Uh, do your tests, your, your quiz early. So that people don't get into your account we have the fact that there's a quiz tomorrow i would advise you to do your quiz early because we have a class at 17 and there's another quiz next week so we can't afford to miss our class tomorrow are we clear no 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 tomorrow's quiz only has got circular motion and centripetal motion the, the quiz on Friday next week has got rotational work, energy, and momentum. So we can't afford to miss our class tomorrow. Okay, so I'll see you tomorrow. Thank you, sir. Have a good weekend. Oh, not yet. Weekend is not yet. Okay. Thank you, sir. All right, cheers.